Continuing education knows that at the end, students want to graduate and we can help them do that because we take the time to really listen to their needs and we understand all the different options that are available across the campus for them. We don't take a cookie cutter approach. We realize each student comes with their own story. So whether it's a part-time student looking to complete a degree program or someone just looking for online courses, we're there to connect them to the resources of the university. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jan Burton, and I am a big supporter of the arts in the city of Boulder. <laughs> Yay, the arts! <laughs> um, and I'm the chair of an organization called Create Boulder, and we instigated the recent ballot measure that's got voted in by 75% of the voters to support the arts mm -hmm. with an extra $3.7 million <laughs> per year. Yay! Mm -hmm. For recording purposes, today is April 11th, 2024. It's 10.30 a.m. and this panel number is 17954. And the title is Art Making, the Best Antidepressant Ever. And I'd like to welcome those on uh, video live stream as well as all of you in the room. Before we get started, the University of Colorado Boulder, Colorado's flagship university, honors and recognizes the many contributions of indigenous peoples in our state. CU Boulder acknowledges that it's located on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and many other Native American nations. Their forced removal from these territories has caused devastating and lasting impacts. While the University of Colorado Boulder can never undo or rectify the devastation wrought on indigenous peoples, we commit to improving and enhancing engagement with indigenous peoples and issues locally and globally. We will do this by recognizing and, and amplifying the voices of indigenous CU Boulder students, staff, and faculty in their work. Educating, conducting research, supporting student success, and integrating indigenous knowledge, consulting, engaging and working collaboratively with tribal nations to enhance our ability to provide access and culturally sensitive support and to recruit, retain, and graduate Native American students in a climate that is inclusive and respectful. Um, one thing I'd like to uh, mention is that we would like to make sure that you get a chance to ask questions and the way, that's how we're going to handle Q&A. So we'll reserve time at the end for Q&A, and many of you know that we do um, encourage students to ask questions, so if you are a student, uh, please designate so on, uh, we'll have two producers who will be walking around, David is one, and Lila is here, there's Lila. And if you would like to ask a question, raise your hand, they'll bring a card and a pencil to you, you can fill out your question, and then, um, Ask, raise your hand again and they'll pick them up and bring them to me. So I will be integrating all of your questions into the thoughtful comments of our, um, of our panel. And now I'd like to do a brief introduction for each panelist. Uh, and for more information, you can find their, their panels on the website, which you can access via your phone. And there's a special little section on the speaker bios. Directly to my right is Tai Tashiro, who is an author, psychologist, and relationship expert. He has published two books about social science and relationships and characteristics that can propel socially awkward people towards extraordinary achievements. He has great knowledge about what makes people tick. He's from New York City and has been here quite a few years, so welcome back, Tai. Mary Reynolds Thompson, to his right, is an author, speaker, and a facilitator of poetry and journal therapy. A pioneer in the spiritual ecology movement, her focus is on the transformative power of landscape archetypes and nature metaphors to review our true purpose and right relationship with the planet. To her right is Eli Hans, who is an entrepreneur, 
transformational theater coach, motivational workshop leader, stage actor and playwright, theater producer, director and composer and singer. Eli lives in a very artistic community in Mexico with his partner and is doing a production at the Dairy this weekend called Out of the Blue, and I do have a ticket for that. <laughs> <laughs> and to Eli's right is Danielle Seawalker, who is a Lakota citizen of the Standing Rock Sioux Nation in North Dakota. As a multidisciplinary fine artist and muralist, she works across disciplines to explore the intersections of Native American stereotypes and is currently working on the Red, Ro Red Road Project using words, photographs, and video to document what it means to be Native American in the 21st century. And fortunately, she's from Denver and has also been involved in the dairy with uh, Native American um, exhibits. So, <laughs> yay to our panelists. The title of the session is Art Making, the Best Antidepressant Ever, and I explained to them that I personally have felt somewhat depressed in the last couple of months. My sister went through a very serious health crisis that I became involved with. I myself broke my foot and sprained it really badly, and so I've not been able to get out in nature, which is my cure uh, therapy. And so I've been feeling kind of down. And so when I got handed this title by Bob Yates and Martha Piper, I thought, oh, perfect. I can learn what I can do about my own uh, depression. So I'm go we have talked, and they're, uh, they're going to make some opening statements. And Mary, I think you're going to lead the way. I, I am. So welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, when you were a little kid, do you remember doing art at school? Do you remember, maybe it was a painting, or you made an ashtray in those days? When I was growing up, you could actually make ashtrays. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a poem, and you brought it back to your parents, your grandparents, your guardians, whomever, and you showed it to them. And what you wanted them to do, more than anything in the world, is look at it, read it, whatever, and say, this is magnificent, this is beautiful. How did you ever think to put a purple pony, you know, um, tail on a pony? You know, how incredible. This is our first place of belonging. When we create and we gift our creation to the world and it is received, mm -hmm we start our journey of belonging. Unfortunately, in our culture, art making has been commodified, right? I know this, I spent years working in advertising and marketing as a copywriter and brander and all those things. And believe you me, there was nothing healing in that process. It was competitive, it was um, stressful, it wasn't. So just the making and just the creating, I don't think is enough. It's allowing to create and bring forth something in you without being told when to do it, how to do it, or why you should do it. It's this offering of the deeper self to the world. Mm. Metaphor, I work a lot with poetry. Metaphor is also this really extraordinary thing that we don't do enough homage to, I don't think, in our culture. Because when the other thing about creating is that we surprise ourselves, right? Have you ever written something and gone, where did that come from? Or done a painting and went, where is that image? I didn't even know that I knew there was an image like that, and suddenly it's on the canvas. So there's there's this thing about working in the arts, whether, whatever kind of arts it is, where something literally leaps from your depths onto the page, the canvas, whatever. And once it's gone from the unconscious to the conscious, that's the point where you can begin to work with it. So there's this wonderful um, phrase by, um, Robert Bly, he talks about leaping poetry. So I love it, just think about the energy of that. 
You are engaged in something creative and something leaps out of you. Feel that energy into the world. It's, it's an amazing thing. And those metaphors can be very surprising and bewildering. They can leap also from one image to another. And in that moment, they feel very disconnected. You see a salmon swimming upstream, that's an image. You see your mother washing dishes at the sink. How are those two images connected? What's the story between them? This is the beginning of healing, is finding the images that we hold, bringing them to the surface, and working with them. So I want to read you a poem because I love poetry, and this is a very simple poem, and yet I think it's a very beautiful poem, and I think it speaks to how embodied the arts are, how it, the arts inhabit sort of every cell of our being, and how in observing art con as a consumer or a creator, something extraordinary happens. How to Eat a Poem by Eve Merriam. Don't be polite. Bite in. Pick it up with your fingers and lick the juice that may run down your chin. It is ready and ripe now, whenever you are. You do not need a knife or fork or spoon or plate or napkin or tablecloth, for there is no core or stem, or rind, or pit, or seed, or skin, to throw away. So we can ingest our art when it is witnessed, when it is received, we receive it back and can take it into ourselves. But that's to me is the healing bit. We get to give it and then to receive it back, and then we get to don't be polite and really ingest it. Thank you, Mary. Beautiful. Eli, would you like to riff on that a little bit? <laughs> sure, thank you for that. Good morning, everybody. I am so thrilled to be here because this is my favorite, favorite, favorite thing to ever <laughs> think about and talk about. I was my life was literally saved by the arts as a kid. I grew up in Mexico City, and I was the guinea pig generation of Montessori schools. Anybody heard of Montessori? So that was very rare in Mexico to have something like that. And it was in English because the Montessori director was American. And I remember kinesthetically in my body the moment that they put me in front of an easel with finger paints and I went like mm. this and then I went like mm. that <laughs> and I can see the red and the yellow <laughs> and the feeling of my hands with the paint and I thought this is the most incredible <laughs> thing ever and I have permission to do this <laughs> And I can choose to do this anytime I want. It was just incredible. And that was the beginning of my relationship with that aspect of me, my creative side, and with, and with art. And I just want to be clear that, you know, when we talk and think about art um, and creativity, to me, they're different. Mm. You know, creativity is the process of downloading from source and it's just running through our veins and mm. we can be creative in so many different ways. I've heard so many people in my life say, oh, you're so creative, I'm not creative. Mm. Like it's something that they're damaged with mm -hmm. because they're not. Well, I think all of us as humans are creative. We're just creative in different ways. We can be creative in the way we put ourselves together. Uh, in the morning with our outfit. Or we could be creative in the kitchen. It doesn't necessarily mean to be artistic. But what I do know is that I'm sure all of you have experienced at some point, uh, you know, when you're engaged in something you love so much that the time just flies. Can anybody relate to that moment? Mm -hmm. And when you're there and you can't believe that four hours just went mm -hmm. by and it felt like 15 minutes, that's when we are in the mm -hmm. zone of creativity 
and downloading from source, doing what you were meant to be doing on this planet. <laughs> and I don't find anything more thrilling <laughs> than that. So I'm very excited that we're gonna have some conversations this morning about what that is mm -hmm. and that everyone can partake in that beautiful energy that is literally life-giving. Mm. Thank you, Eli. Danielle, would you like to make your opening, opening comments? On Petu Wash Day, Mitakuyapi, Danielle C. Walker, Machiapi, Mahum Papa Lakota, Na Chetishaku in Mahata, Denver, Colorado, Awati. Good morning. I always like to start off by introducing myself in my language, the Lakota language, a language that has lain dormant and almost on the verge of extinction for many generations. Um, but hello, I am uh, Danielle C. Walker, and what I said was good morning, relatives. My name is Danielle C. Walker. I'm Hunkpapa Lakota from the Standing Rock Sioux Nation, um, but I currently live in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> so very simple. Um, I yeah I, I I've struggled for a long time calling myself an artist. I always felt like I don't know if I'm worthy of that or if I have earned that. Um, but I create art, so that's I guess what they call it when you create art. You're an artist. Um, I. Like Eli mentioned, art really s sincerely saved my life. I grew up um, as a child of teen parents who were struggling um, with alcoholism and um, in and out of prisons and uh, being unhoused. And I, um, as a Native American child growing up in North Dakota, it's sort of all the odds were stacked against me in terms of statistics. And um, in my culture, it's not very common to express yourself emotionally through words. You don't go to therapy. You don't talk about how you feel, your feelings. And really, the only way that I knew how to express myself in my solita solitude, which I was alone a lot as a child, was to, to draw, color, paint. And um, we didn't have a lot, so I remember having like broken crayons in my pocket and just whatever I could to scribble and, and create. And that was how I expressed myself. And I've always said art is my medicine. Mm. It's really... Um, the way that I heal myself, how I express myself, is, even as an adult, I still don't always know how to express myself verbally. And so I still translate a lot of emotions I can't get out um, onto canvas or on a wall if I'm painting a mural. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's a little bit about um, who I am, but um, I remember sort of like the finger paint. I, I remember having these like really crappy dollar store crayons and if anybody know if you know you know <laughs> they don't like they don't like they don't have the pigment they're they break every time you push hard and i just remember getting my first box of crayola crayons and being like just inhaling the smell of the crayola crayons and thinking i am the most wealthiest child to have this box of crayons did you eat any of them no i would never i saved that for the paper um because the grape one was delicious <laughs> <laughs> and I would like, and I remember getting into a certain grade level and we got, I got like the big pack with the crayon sharpener in the back and I was like, okay, what is my life? Um, but yeah, so anyway, I just, I've always just cherished how art has been healing and it's um, still continues to be a healing journey for me. Mm. So, yes. yeah. Thank you, Danielle. Ty. Yeah, so n nothing like a little science to put a damper <laughs> on the creativity. <laughs> I, I took this a little too literal, maybe. Uh, the title, of the best antidepressant ever. I love CW, CWA titles, right? They just kind of put it in your face, and that's, that's aggressive. So. Uh, I was, so I should let you know, I, I was trained in a medical model. Like, whatever kind of nightmare uh, scenario you might have in your head for someone who's kind of rigid and overly sterile about things, that was... That was my training. It's okay. I think there's value to it, but I just want you to know that's the perspective that I'm coming from. And, and now I'm like, well, does this art therapy thing work? Let's, let's see. And what I'll tell you is that I was surprised. So I got into it, and, and what I found was this, was that when uh, people were struggling with uh, mild depression or dealing with significant stressors that hadn't reached severe levels of like PTSD or anxiety disorder. Um, art therapy performed just as well as antidepressants, and in fact, in some cases, performed even better. I think the argument for best antidepressant ever might be 
what a lot of the other panelists talked about, which is, is accessibility to everybody, right? Unlike paying someone $200 an hour to, to talk to, uh, creativity is available to all of us and, mm -hmm. and, and we can all do it. So I think that's a good argument for, for maybe best ever. Now, one of the caveats here is I think sometimes when it's a moderate to severe case of, let's say, depression or anxiety disorder, or PTSD, then, you know, you want the art therapy probably supplemented with something else is kind of where it's at right now. But uh, I, was, I was thoroughly impressed with, with the power that it can have. There, there were a couple of things, too, that kind of shook me a little bit from, from my worldview. Uh, if I think about depression, for example, I say, well, do you have five of the nine criteria in the DSM? Has it persisted for two weeks? And all these kind of uh, cold metrics. They, they asked in, in a few studies, and what I loved about these is they were cross-cultural. I think Danielle brings up a really important point about the assumptions we might have based on our worldview about how we're supposed to heal, right? And in some cultures, we think we should just talk about it, and that's the way to heal, but there's, of course, many ways to do it. One of the things they asked folks is they said, depression is, and they said, complete the sentence. And what they found was that in uh, diverse populations, it was often described as a beast, or as a monster, or as an embodied person who was an antagonist. It was very concrete in its manifestation. They also described it as a weight, a physical weight, and as a container that they couldn't escape. Uh, the other thing that I thought was illuminating is that in some um, non-white cultures, the therapist or the psychiatrist was described as a captor or as a persecutor, which is a little you know, uh, hard to take when that's your, your, your training, but I think it's something to be open to. So, you know, this, this idea that we need to broaden the way, e even just linguistically or in our world view of how we approach struggling and suffering, um, I think is a really important concept. Um, the, the other thing I'll say is that there are a few things that, that came up here that I was so pleased to hear about. You know, Mary had talked about this, you create it, but then so important is how it's received by the other person, right? And uh, across psychotherapies, the most important component is, is not all these fancy techniques and so forth, it's the quality of the relationship with the therapist. Mm -hmm. That there's an unconditional positive regard for who you are at the core as a person. And I think uh, these creative therapies provide a tremendous way to, to do that. Uh, <laughs> Eli, I love the idea of the finger, <laughs> the finger paint that's such a rich, <laughs> way to talk about taking something that's a that's an energy and manifesting that in a concrete kind of way and so one of the things they did in a meta-analysis where they aggregated the results of a lot of different studies is they found that um, things like multiple modes of communication so not just language right mm -hmm. manifesting in a in a material kind of way in a physical kind of way and the quality of the relationship between the artist or the creator and the person receiving it these were actually th three of the five most powerful components that drove the, uh, drove the effects of the healing. So um, I, I had this uh, quote from Sylvia Plath I found that I've always enjoyed about uh, a different perspective about how to describe struggle. And, and she said, because wherever I sat on the deck of a ship or a street cafe in Paris, or Bangkok, I would be sitting under the same glass bell jar, stewing in my own sour air. Mm. What a rich way to describe the experience, right? And so I'm, I'm so excited to be here today and, and talk with folks about how we can open up our minds to thinking more broadly uh, about struggle, but also about healing. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Any thoughts on what each of you have said? I do. I, I find it interesting that both Mary and Ty mentioned like, you know, you create the art and then you put it out in the world and then you're waiting for the response on how it's received. I, I'm actually an outlier in that, I think, and I'm an outlier in a lot of facets of my life, but um, I have only started publicly showing my art um, a few years ago. Uh, most people wouldn't believe that, um, as I show in a lot of museums and galleries today. 
Um, but it, I get, I've always created for the sake of creating for myself. Cause again, that's how I released my emotions and tried to figure out, navigate how I was feeling. And it would just translate onto a canvas. Um, and I'm, I'm still to this day really scared to, to hear, to see what people think. It still freaks me out because it's so, um, personal that it's almost like showing somebody my diary. Mm. And, um, so like a lot of times I won't go to my own openings, when I'm at my own openings, I like to steer clear of like the gallery area where people are looking at my art because it just creates a whole anxiety for me. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to share that as you were both talking about that, I, I was thinking, wow, I'm the weirdo that does not do that. <laughs> I don't like to hear back the, the reception, so. I think it takes a lot of vulnerability for an artist to, to share their work with others. Um, you know, I think that as artists, we do create for ourselves, you know, that moment of creation is so magical, like nothing else. And yet there is a moment where we choose to share it with others through our writing, through, mm -hmm. you know, a painting or um, any other form. The last few years, I've been focusing a lot on theater. And I find that the energy that happens, mm -hmm. the exchange that happens in live theater with an audience is like nothing else I've ever experienced. I mean, you can you can sense the energy of the audience reflecting back, you know, and it's just giving me chills as I speak about it. It's instant, it's mm -hmm. like instant response. They laugh, they cry, they breathe during a pause. They're just waiting for the next thing and there's no other high like it um, for me because it's so immediate and at the end, um, you know, I'm, I'm speaking about the show that we're here to do, I was terrified to share this very, very authentic personal story about my struggles in my life. Um, I had a 10% chance of, of um, healing from cancer, and the only way that I could do that in my mind is to make peace with my past. So I'm sharing all these personal things. I had no idea how an audience was going to deal with a gay storyline of a gay boy growing up in a conservative Mexican Jewish community. Who's going to even come see that, I thought. Well, what's happened since is that we're all human, and all these themes are universal. And when we share from an open heart, the audience receives it in such a beautiful way. It gives them permission to then share from a vulnerable place mm -hmm. about their lives, and then it just becomes an exchange. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of healing, and that's how depression can be lifted, I believe, by just opening our hearts and telling the truth. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful. I, I want to second that about the vulnerability that you've both talked about. There is nothing more vulnerable than putting one's soul art out into the world, you know, which, as I say, is very different than commodity art. Um, and it's... It's really interesting to me, too, because I think there is this vulnerability is also very alive, right? It's like we can get into a real comfort zone and everything's kind of okay, but we're not really, we have a sense that we're not fully living. There is something about engaging in art and like Eli says, that covers a wide spectrum of activities that has us feel alive. You know, with my sort of philosophy, it's because we're participating in the creativity of the earth and universe, that that is our natural state. We are here to create. I would say we're all here to bring more beauty into the world, one way or another. And when we are doing that, suddenly life takes on meaning. And I think we live in a world that is really kind of, you know, what's the meaning of life is you earn a living, you buy a house, you retire, you do all these things. This is not very lively, <laughs> you know, it feels rather onerous really. And so there is something about owning all of our creativity which is really saying we are alive, we're here to contribute, we're here to be seen, we're here to honor each other, we're like this great wild chorus of creativity that is actually longing to burst forth. And if it doesn't burst forth, where does it go? 
right? Mm -hmm. you, you can probably speak to that better than I, but it, it, it becomes anger and resentment and depression and all of those things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, kind of important, however vulnerable we are yeah. mm -hmm. in yeah. the process to, to do it. I, 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 like, I love the idea of necessity. Yeah. You know, this isn't just like a frivolous thing or an optional mm -hmm. thing. There's a, a necessity to do it because, yes, what happens if you don't have an outlet for some of these things? And one of the uh, beautiful things I think I've noticed in the other panelists' comments is that there was something so big or so vague, right? How could you possibly wrap your mind around it with only language or with the existing uh, models or views available? right? Mm -hmm. It might be something that's a dialectic, so something where there's two things that are true at once. Maybe you've had someone in your life who is both extraordinarily loving at times and monstrous at other times and mm -hmm. existed within the same person. How do you articulate that? How do you make sense of that? Uh, how do you make sense of life experiences for which there's no other template or you've never met somebody who shared that with you? Um, art provides this amazing way to fill in the gaps between the logic and all these other ways we know the world and allows you to express it and put it out there in a way that, and as Danielle said, it doesn't necessarily always have to be shared even. There's an intrinsic value to that creation all by itself, um, but as we've also heard, it can be amplified mm -hmm. through community as well. And yet, imagine what would happen if, if art wasn't shared and creativity wasn't shared. Look around you, look in this room, Look at every article of clothing that you have. Look at the chairs, this pen, the design of the mm. lamps. Everything around us was created by someone. And if they hadn't shared it, we'd all be sitting here naked in a gray cube. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no your, cube. Your house would be a gray cube. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, the idea and why we're here on Earth is to bring forth our ideas and manifest them into form. I mean, that is what happens on this planet, mm -hmm. right? And then if we can use our creativity to make mm -hmm. things better, mm -hmm. and I love your blouse, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody did a good job with that. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, can you imagine everything in our world is, is shared by artists and creators? But yet the arts are the first thing to get cut in budgets. Yeah. yeah. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're just saying. Because it's... Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 In fact, uh, a question from the audience uh, says, young adults are struggling with mental health now more than ever, and a lot of schools are defunding and getting rid of art programs. How can students find avenues of artistic expression outside of school? And I might also add another question. Um, I think many of us, because you, you mentioned doing art as a child, mm -hmm. and I, I believe uh, that many of us were told Maybe our art wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. So we decided somewhere along the way that we are not artistic. Mm -hmm. And um, that's true for me. I support the arts, but I don't mm -hmm. feel like I'm artistic. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then how can I use art in healing if I don't view myself as an artist? And how would you encourage young people to, to explore art? I think it's so important, it starts at home. I think it's so important for parents to support the artistic or creative side of their children uh, and encourage that. I was so lucky that my parents did like, uh, what do you call those woo-woo uh, relationship retreats and you know, <laughs> all those things. Even living in Mexico, they would come to California to Esalen and they'd come back and process and all that kind of stuff. So when they figured out that I was terrible at sports and I failed at everything uh, sports related, uh, but I was good at drawing and all those things, they put me in an after school program with art, making puppets and doing theater and painting and ceramics and I thrived in that. And then I felt better about myself and my self esteem at school. So taking that forward, some years ago, I worked for the Institute for Arts Education in San Diego, and because there were no arts programs in the schools, this private institution, and there's many around the country, get funded to create arts programs in music, dance, uh, uh, visual arts, and theater for kids from K through 12. Mm -hmm. 
And what we saw, a lot of the kids were at risk of joining gangs and you know, getting into some bad situations. And what we saw is that by engaging in art, their self-esteem improved. They all, all of a sudden realized, oh, I didn't know I was funny, or I didn't know I could write, I didn't know I could paint. And their um, academics started to rise just as much at the same level. And their self-esteem grew. And some of the kids in junior high pulled out of gangs and they realized, I want to finish school, I want to go to college. So there are options out there, but I think it starts at home with parents noticing and realizing how important it is to support the creativity of their children. I'd like to add something to, to that. Sorry, were you speaking to anyone? No? Nope. Not yet. I had an echo, okay. <laughs> um, one of the things, I think kids are creating, and there have been a lot of panels that have addressed this during this conference on world affairs, but, but often alone. I mean, it's like you can do so much on your iPad that you can go home, you can create TikToks, you can create movies, you can do all kinds of creative things, but it's in isolation. So I think oftentimes to be really therapeutic, there needs to be community involved. Yes that when we create in community, it's an entirely different experience. So theater, you know, is one such thing. You're not only learning about creativity, but about relationships, about, you know, finding out where you fit in with the, in the greater schemes of things. I mean, there are many elder cultures that do not believe you can come in to your personhood without community that it's actually community that draws you forth and recognizes you as this unique person that you are with your unique skills, etc. So the trouble is creativity now has become something that we do in a darkened bedroom, right? You know, we just kind of tune out everything and we just go into ourselves. And I think that's a recipe for depression, mm -hmm. quite honestly. <coughs> so that creativity has to be celebrated within our cultures. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like I create in solitude and I'm not, doesn't create depression for me. It actually is the opposite. Mm -hmm. So I challenge that a little bit, but I also yeah. want to address um, the, the, the concept of people. I hear this time and time again. Oh, I love art. I'm involved in the arts. I appreciate the arts, but I'm not good at art. Mm -hmm. And that makes my heart hurt because who says you're not good at art? Art is so subjective and there's no rules. There's no right or wrong answer and that is the beauty of creating. Just because somebody doesn't like your piece of art doesn't mean you're a bad artist or you're not good at art. Really, it's all about what, how you feel and how it makes you feel and express yourself while you're creating. Yes. And so that's what we should be focusing on versus what other people think. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very simple context. Who cares what other people think, right? But the reality is we are all trained in this colonized world on knowing what other people think or caring about what other people think but really art is that's the beauty of it and I think that's what separates it from so many other things in life is that it's really about how it makes you feel mm. so just create I challenge everybody in this room if you don't feel like you're good at art just do it anyway because it's you'll feel better at the end of it yes <laughs> one, one thing I might say just about the the young person uh, part of this is that uh, one of the challenges I think for young people is that the, the world is so fragmented mm. that they live in. Uh, I had an experience a little while ago, uh, two people wiser than me, uh, about appreciating, appreciating different forms of art had these comments that really changed my perspective. There's that movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once, mm. which some mm. of you might have seen, right? Did yeah. pretty good this year. Yeah. And, and I saw it and I, I enjoyed it, but I, I didn't understand it. Uh, some, a Gen Z person told me, that story is not about the mom. It's that it's about the daughter. And it's about what it's like to be a young person in the modern world and how fragmented and how torn you feel between multiple realities. And so, of course, it doesn't make sense to somebody who wasn't raised with a smartphone, right? Wasn't raised with social media because we had a more coherent kind of sense of things, right? And it's a, it's a real challenge young people face. It's not their fault. Right, um, but I think that's one pl one place to come from. The other thing that followed closely on the heels of that was I didn't really love Billie Eilish, which I'm a little bit ashamed to say. I know she's quite popular, but someone said the reason that 
Gen Z love Billie Eilish, especially early Billie Eilish, was if you go back and listen to her music, what she's masterfully done is taken little fragments. So like the sound of a turn signal, uh, the, the, the sound of a shoe scraping on the ground, and they've integrated that into a coherent narrative and melody and beat that actually makes sense. And that's, uh, this young person told me, that's what we all want. We want for this fragmented world to make sense in some coherent kind of way. So, you know, I'm not saying all Gen Z folks are going through that, but I think it is a, a different way of seeing the world and a, a challenge that maybe some of the rest of us didn't have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, great. This is a question from the audience uh, directed to Danielle, but I think it could be answered by any of you. Um, can you speak to how the arts have saved you emotionally, spiritually, or financially? And you touched on that in your intro comments. And more broadly, your Native American sisters and brothers. Um, but I think that's a question that could be answered by anyone. And I might ask an, a follow-on uh, for those of you who are artists, and, but you can answer it too. Uh, I'm sure <laughs> as an artist, you may reach a block at some point. You know, we call it a writer's block or creative block. How have you overcome that block? And you're a writer as well. You've written two books. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Well, I'm not quite, you know. <laughs> so, Danielle, if we can start with you on that and then. Uh... So, um, art, how art saved me. Um, I didn't realize how art saved me until I was in my 20s. Um, as I mentioned in my intro, I had been creating ever since I can ever remember, whether it was like playing with rocks in the backyard and like making a mosaic or whatever I had at my fingertips. Again, I was really, we were really, really poor and couldn't um, afford a lot of things. Um, and so I, I, because I was spent a lot of time alone as a child and I grew up in a very toxic environment with a lot of trauma and abuse and poverty and at times I went days without eating. Um, I just had to like, I, I was walked around as a very confused as a child and not knowing how to express why I'm going through these things or what this means or where's my mom at today or whatever it was. So I would create, I would write stories about a fictional character basically probably me, a reflection of myself, and I would just write these stories or I would draw these pictures or whatever it was, creativity, um, creativity, create whatever I'm trying to say. Um, <laughs> um, but then when I got into my 20s, I did succumb to some troubles um, and started making a little bit of bad decisions and veered away from art. And it was a few years that I didn't even pick up a paintbrush, I didn't draw, I didn't involve myself in anything really creat creatively, and um, I was lost. I was really lost, and I was probably at my most depressed um, phase in my life, and I felt very alone. And um, then I got pregnant with my first son, and that stopped a lot of the bad behaviors because I had to make smarter choices um, because I was gonna be a new mom. And um, I picked up a paintbrush again. Mm -hmm. And I realized in that moment that art really saved my life as a child. And now again, as a young adult about to become a mother, I realized that art was a, an extension of my spirit. It's almost like something that I can't live without, um, almost like a limb. Um, I'm lost without it. And so um, ever since that moment of re introducing myself to the creativity um, that is innately within me. Um, I've never looked back and it's just something that, it, it, you know, it took me a while to realize how art is really an extension of who I am and I cannot live without it. Mm. Mm, great. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else like to answer? Uh, Eli, we talked about creative blocks. Uh, yeah. Oh, don't you hate that? <laughs> oh, it's so great when you're in the flow and everything's going great and you're in your zone and all of a sudden something happens and you're stuck. And I'm talking mm -hmm. stuck. Nothing is coming out and the desperation of it and you wonder, is it over? I mean, will it ever come <laughs> back? Am I, I'm doomed. I mean, for me, that's when depression can happen, mm -hmm. is when that gets blocked. Mm -hmm. So I've learned through some courses of study that I've had is that that kind of energy is like 
energy that's the opposite of expansion you know it's just like mm -hmm. contracted 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 energy and the more you force it the more contracted mm -hmm. you get so what I've learned is to honor it and just step away from it mm -hmm. and then go do something that's yes. expansive in energy mm -hmm. like it could be as simple as uh, I'm gonna go play with my dog mm -hmm. or it could be a walk in nature so many of us are healed by nature mm -hmm. Or, you know, just trusting that it's going to come and then all of a sudden, boom, it usually is like Drano at four in the morning. <laughs> boom, all these ideas. Uh, it's like getting up in the morning, going, ah, i got to write this idea. It's like, oh, i got to write another idea. <laughs> and so it's a matter of knowing that it's temporary and trusting mm -hmm. that you're going to get through it. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of good can happen during a block. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stewing. You know when you put, you're making a cake and you stick it in the oven, you don't yell at it to hurry up, right? <laughs> it's like, it's like, hurry up! It's like, a, that cake is gonna take 45 minutes. I don't care what you do, that cake's not gonna get done yeah. sooner. So might as well just go do something yeah. else. You'll smell it when it's ready. And then you come and then you open the oven and there it is. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with a block. Every mm -hmm. block has its own timing. The thing is, you don't know how much time it's going to be. <laughs> That's the but the bigger the idea, sometimes the bigger the block. Mm -hmm. So just know it's brewing, it's mm -hmm. cooking, it's coming. Mm -hmm. Go do something else and have fun. Mm -hmm. Go to the beach in Puerto Vallarta for a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking about um, channeling, which is that place of flow right when you don't have a writer's block or an artist's block and it's just kind of emerging but also control because I think when I was a little kid my offerings of my writing I was always putting on plays I got my first really bad review from my um six-year-old cousin who wanted his sixpence back because he <laughs> didn't like my production oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I want my pocket money back. But I think to some extent, I grew up in an alcoholic family. It was a way where I had a realm that I could control. This was the fantasy that I was creating. I could make the characters do what I wanted mm. to do. So it is, I think, this art making process is this sort of thing between creating the realities that we want to inhabit and also opening up to that deeper wisdom that flows through all of us. And there's an amazing Elizabeth Gilbert. Do you all know the fabulous yeah. Elizabeth Gilbert? She tells a story of the poet Ruth Stone, who will be out in the field, um, and an idea for a poem will come to her. Do you know this? Yeah. And so Ruth will run into her farmhouse so she can write down the poem. And sometimes she manages to write it down, but she writes it down backwards because it's still so thing. And sometimes she watches that idea like tumbleweed moving on into the world mm -hmm. where someone else will pick it up. Mm -hmm. And I love that idea. Mm -hmm. There are ideas floating everywhere. It's yes. going to be you, or it's going to be you, or it's going to be me. If we love the idea, it would be kind of cool if we were the one to put it out there. And yeah. I love that she says you have to grab it by the tail yeah, before, right. before it goes to somebody else. <laughs> exactly. If it came to you, it's because you're the one to bring it forth. Right, but if you don't, yeah. yeah. I'd like to ask about nature and creativity and healing. Because I know, um, Mary, you have uh, talked about the importance of nature to you, and it may be the case with others as well. So can you talk about how nature is healing and how that ties in with creativity? Um, for me, the primary text of the world is the world itself. The world speaks to us all the time, if only we listen. And so for me, being in nature is a way of understanding who I am. I mean, we are just the earth in human form, right? You know, we're just an expression of the earth. And so if we don't spend time in nature, then we don't really understand our own nature because it is nature. You know, we talk about humans and animals. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. We are just one form of animal. So, and there's aliveness in nature. There's beauty in nature. There's the sensuality of wind touching your skin in nature. 
there's a tree that you can lean against and tell all your troubles to. Anybody hide letters in trees when they were kids or whisper their secrets to yeah. trees? Yeah. yeah. There are safe places. And I have had um, very serious downloads, like stop living like this from the natural world. Literally trees that have said, oh, honey, you know, and if my mother had said it or I'd heard it through some human thing, I'd be like, get away. But somehow nature can speak to us. And nature is the ultimate creator. So I think if we're blocked, like you said, go for a walk in nature because nature just does it effortlessly all of the time. And guess what? We're nature. So, you know, yeah. Um, I just want to say about that, that has, does anybody know here about the idea of grounding or earthing? Mm. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm going to kind of mess this up, but I, apparently the earth has a certain frequency. Mm -hmm. And when we wear rubber shoes and when we're in tall buildings and all that, we kind of lose that connection. Mm. And so, I mean, just laying in the grass. Yeah. Where I live, there's not a lot of grass where we can mm. lay on. There's a lot of cobblestones that are beautiful, but I love coming to Boulder and mm. we just laid on the grass under a tree and just felt literally mm. the energy mm. balancing out from the travel and everything in kind of coming into alignment mm. with the energy of the earth. Mm. And I think that that's what you're talking about that makes us feel grounded centered clear mm. and then we can move on and create mm. there's a um, philosophy i grew up learning from elders in my community and it's a, a phrase that is taku which means something sacred moves through everything and really can you say it again taku <laughs> Everyone say, repeat thing. after me. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yes. Taku wankan which means something sacred moves through everything. And really, it um, goes all ties back to Unchi Maka, our grandmother Earth, mm -hmm. and how she provides everything for us. Um, and so. I know when I'm feeling a block or lost, the best thing for me is to go out into nature. I've been on the drive up here, I was just like kind of whining about how I just can't wait to like spend more time outside and it gets nicer out. But when I, I'm from North Dakota originally and there's something that I'm very attached to the lands in which my ancestors have always known and um, where I grew up, the prairies and the, the prairie grass, the prairie flowers, the songbirds, the meadowlark, I can hear the meadowlark singing in the morning, the dragonflies buzzing around, the wind, I can close my eyes and like hear the wind whistling, um, the smells of sweet grass. Does anybody know the smell of sweet grass? It's mm. such a beautiful smell in the summer. So those things are all inspiring for me. And when I'm feeling a block creati creatively or emotionally, I always go back to those places. I go back home and just exist with those lands. Mm -hmm. I'm, this is an audience question. I'm gonna ask you, Ty. Right. but anyone else can respond as well. If you knew someone who was cl clinically depressed, would you advocate that they looked at feeling better by using drugs, I imagine that's pharmaceuticals, or making art? What factors might you apply when deciding which cure to recommend? Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see. I'm on spot here. So, uh, y you know, the first thing I'd say is, is ha have them go see someone who does this every day, right? Have them go see a, a professional about it. Um, but you can, you can offer it up. What seemed to me to be the case was that when the severity was moderate or severe, right, then you should probably look at some medication or traditional psychotherapy. Um, that seems to be the, the better route to go. But I would say if it's something in the, in the mild range, which is hard to assess sometimes if you, you, know, you don't do this all day, but if it's something more mild, then something like an art therapy could be very powerful. The other thing I'll also say is that if it's a friend who has not had a lot of success with traditional interventions, right, uh, with uh, drugs or with traditional psychotherapy, then the uh, creative interventions could be extraordinarily powerful. Um, I've, I've certainly anecdotally known of clients who got into dance therapies mm -hmm. or theatrical therapies, and it just allowed them to make contact, 
with this ineffable thing that otherwise they couldn't access. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and just to uh, pick up on something from earlier too, I think it's so important that it be something active, mm -hmm. right? That it's something manifest where there's actually something concrete you can touch, mm -hmm. you know, or, or something that you, you can sing mm -hmm. that's actually physical. This seems to be a really important component about the, about the creative mm -hmm. process. Thank you. Another question that is uh, not similar, but uh, is the science side of things, how can art be beneficial to the aut autism population? Mm. Oh yeah, uh, very beneficial. So uh, awkwardness is like the next door neighbor of autism. Um, so most psychological, what we would call psychological diagnoses, actually those symptoms are normally distributed in the general population. Psychology and psychiatry would have you think that you either have something or you don't. Uh, in fact, the average person might have one or two mild depressive symptoms or one or two mild autistic traits. Um, for people who are autistic, though, there is this disconnect between their interoception, which sometimes we call people's sixth sense, so that connection between your bodily senses and your mind, that if you're maybe starting to have a crush on somebody, you feel something stirring like deep within you and you're not quite sure what it is, that's your interoception. Your mind's picking up on something's kind of going on here that's, that's a little bit different. And so for the arts and, and creative things, especially things with physicality, it can be incredibly powerful for autistic kids to start to connect these things going on with their body that they have a really hard time understanding with what's going on in their mind. So uh, there's a, a lot of actually data on it. I, I, would, I would highly recommend it. Great. And then a, a, a kind of somewhat similar question. For those who struggle to find community because of social anxiety, how can we get over our fear of judgment in order to avoid isolation? And that could be a judgment about um, you know, being artistic, for, for example. Mm. You know, at the beginning of COVID, I, um, well, we were all, if we recall, feeling pretty afraid and very isolated. Um, and um, we feared community for good reason, because we, you know, could kill us, right? Um, but I started running a lot of these writing programs online. What was really interesting to me was that some of the most shy, introverted um, of people, the most uncomfortable, felt incredibly comfortable in online circles. So that was something to find an online community. Um, and many of them did not consider themselves to be artists. They were just there because they needed something, right? But what came out of them was so extraordinarily beautiful and the more that was recognized by this online community, the more they could begin to emerge. So I think it's kind of ironic a little, but sometimes if you do feel fearful of being in community, just being online, you can turn off your video at any moment. You can just click out of something. You have a lot of control about how much you share, how much you, um, you know, participate. So I think that, that that can be something to think about. Can I ask a question to Ty? It's kind of a self-serving question. Um, so I mentioned earlier, like I a lot of times have this imposter syndrome mm -hmm. about acknowledging that I'm an artist, but on paper you'd look and be like, yeah, she's an artist. Um, where do you, where does imposter syndrome come from as it relates to, mm -hmm. you know, the psychology or science behind that? I, I know it's no fun, imposter syndrome, but I see some good news in it, which is it comes from humility. Mm. You know, it, it comes from this cautiousness of wanting to make sure that you're authentic and, and real. Mm -hmm. Now, it can be misaligned, though, to what you actually are. And I think one of the things with creativity that's so interesting to me is that we can turn this creative energy that's so wonderful and productive for the uh, things we produce, we can turn that in on ourselves sometimes and it can attack us and create things that actually aren't real, 
sometimes. I know I can suffer from that as, as, much, as, as much as anybody. Uh, I think a lot of folks have a natural intuition that creativity comes with challenges, right? Uh, they can be psychological or spiritual or what, whatever else, and uh, everything's a mixed bag in life, you know? And so I think that's sometimes the challenge of the artist, though, is um, they're trying to corral that creative mind when it turns mm -hmm. against us sometimes. And, uh, you know, you seem to have such a strong sense of self, right? And I, I really admire that. I think that's great. I think for me, something that's been useful is, uh, as much as I hate it, putting things out there when they're maybe even not my best work. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you hear, hey, I'm not doing so bad in the world mm -hmm. after all, <laughs> right? What a relief. What a relief that is, mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. But, uh, I, I, you know, imposter syndrome, not great, but I, I do, I'd rather have that than have the opposite, mm. which is hubris, yeah. right? For yeah, sure. so I, I actually admire it to a certain extent, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. So nice. Has anyone else faced imposter syndrome? Yeah, everyone? Yeah. <laughs> sure. I think, I think as humans, <laughs> as humans we all do, and especially with what's happened uh, in, in later years with social media where there's so much comparison to the influencers mm -hmm. or the people who get more likes than I get likes and, you know, that kind of a thing. Anyone can immediately grow, uh, you know, their anxiety levels with imposter syndrome right away. I think it's so important to... Dis do our best to disengage from comparison mm. and to just kind of really go inward and own who we are and that who we are is enough and uh, the way that we express in the world is enough and it's not about comparing ourselves to anyone else. Mm. I'm a recovering perfectionist and so <laughs> oh. it's... <laughs> Now I just go for excellence, <laughs> which is about five notches down from, per from perfection. Yeah. So I've got to just learn to, you know what? It's okay if it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. It's just going to, it's the best that I can do right now. And that's got to be good enough, you know, for mm. me. I remember the first time I went through passport control and they asked me what I did. And the first time I said, I'm a writer. I honestly thought they were going to take me off in handcuffs. <laughs> it was so terrifying. It was like I'm imposter, total. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. total <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> so funny. how did you get over that? I, had, um, I wrote another book. <laughs> I, in my in my heart, I said if I get to a certain number of books then I can call myself a writer. Uh -huh. Then I got to that number of books, and then I thought, well, actually, if I just have one oh, more right. book, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then I'll really right. be able to say right. that I know. It's crazy. When they you said, get on the bestsellers list, then right. you'll be a writer. Right. They <laughs> said that they wouldn't let Edward Matisse into his own exhibits because he would come in and try to change what was on oh. the canvas because oh, he felt so insecure. Mm. You oh. know, it's like, no, it's not, it's <laughs> not oh, oh, perfect. This, did anybody see the Netflix special on We Are The World, how that song was made? Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. Okay, so what really oh. struck me so much about that, right? You have in this room for one night the luminaries of the music world, mm -hmm. right? Top, top talent. The amazing amount of insecurity yeah. that they had when it was their yes. chance to sing one little, like, five-second <laughs> piece. Yes. They were so scared that they weren't enough. Mm -hmm. And I, when I saw that, I thought, okay, this is definitely a human issue. We all have it, even like the top, top people. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, just, it's, the voice is always going to be there, is I think about where are we placing our attention? Are we going to listen to that and give it power? Or are we going to just shift our attention to who we know we mm -hmm. are? And that's yeah. got to be enough. You know, it makes me think, it makes me think, I don't know what about other people, but so many of the artists that I loved growing up and admired their work, they were all alcoholic, drug addicts, mm. multiple divorced, um, they're like, you know, so it's very interesting. I, I'm at the time, you know, it's like it can lead us to healing and wholeness mm -hmm. <laughs> and obviously experienced a different way, it can, not. <laughs> it, yeah, it can, can certainly, it can certainly uh, 
turned against us. Yeah. And th there's been you know a number of investigations about this. Uh, bipolar and creativity is one area mm -hmm. that you know a lot of people probably know about, but it comes with a lot of other things too: the, the, the depression, mm -hmm. substance mm -hmm. abuse, and and all the rest. It just gets out of control yeah. sometimes, and it can be so creative, right, that it creates these monsters, it creates these beasts for us that are sometimes of our own making. Mm. So we've got only uh, five minutes left. This has been a wonderful panel. I would love to encourage each of you to maybe make a final statement to, uh, on a step that someone could make, This those of us who are mere mortals mm. and not superstars <laughs> singing We Are the World. <laughs> what could be a step that we could take that could help our um, or, you know, depression or mental um, uh, situation. Uh, I think you have mentioned journaling before. We've, you know, mentioned finger painting, things like that. So what is one step that someone could take who doesn't consider themselves a, a great artist? Well, you know, I, one of the things I would say is that um, just even appreciating somebody else's creative process can be curative and healing mm. all by itself. Have you ever read a story or heard a song where it just struck you mm. super deep in that place that you can't articulate whatever it was, and you just over and over again read that passage or you listen to that song over and over again? Mm. Um, that's healing, you know, that's, that's curative. And your just natural curiosity that you have about what that thing might be, that's a step, a big step, actually. Right along the way to something to something better. So if you don't consider yourself someone who's creative in a traditional sense, um, that's powerful uh, all by itself. Just have the open-mindedness mm -hmm. and your natural curios curiosity. Mm. Thank you, Thank you Ty. Mm. I, I want not to answer that question and do something else, if I may. Okay. So somebody talked about you know being a little shy in community. I wanted to read a poem that was written during this COVID time by somebody who never considered themselves to be a poet and was very reticent and first in sharing. And this is her voice. I planted an acorn. I planted an acorn yesterday. The earth crumbled in my hands from the abbey ruin and gardens. I want a mighty tree to grow. The earth crumbled in my hands a mystery of life and hope. I want a mighty tree to grow from a place of spiritual peace, a mystery of life and hope amidst the arches and broken walls, a place of spiritual peace, a prayerful offering amidst the arches and broken walls from the abbey ruins and gardens a prayerful offering. I planted an acorn yesterday. May each of our creative offerings be an acorn. Yeah. Mm. Nice. What step can you take? Hang out with people that uplift you, yes. that bring you joy. Maybe do something creative together without any judgment. Just go have some fun with happy people. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Very similar to what Eli and Ty said, I, my immediate response to that question was surround yourself with creative people, even if you don't feel creative, because it might prompt you to feel creative. Um, and if you haven't heard, this weekend there's a play called Out of the Blue <laughs> that you could go support. Could I say just as a bit of self promotion, I, a woman told me. And she's a, a theater critic for 30 years. She said that she had been depressed for two years, seeing a therapist and taking medication. And after seeing Out of the Blue, her depression left. She was able to leave her house, and she went on a tour to Europe. All right. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's got some power. Great. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists very much. And thanks to the audience for coming, both yes. online as well as physically here.